My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, my name is Yolanda Hunt, and I'm an executive assistant, and I work with Wipro. Um, And my all-time favorite quote is actually by Dr. Nelson Mandela, and it states, it always seems impossible until it's done. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Are you tasked with ordering food for your office? Let me tell you about Easy Cater. With over 100,000 restaurants to choose from nationwide and 24-7 customer support, Easy Cater helps assistants like you and me succeed at work and makes our lives easier. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hey friends, welcome to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's episode 230 and this is your host, Jeremy Burrows. And I am under the weather. My voice is a little bit lower and raspier than usual. So maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it is what it is and we're going to roll with it today. Um, But I'm very excited in this episode. Uh, Like I said, episode 230, you can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 230 leaderassistant.com slash 230. And today I'm speaking with Yolanda Hunt. Yolanda has been an executive assistant for over 28 years. Currently, she's the practice administrator for the global head of cybersecurity at Wipro. And Yolanda, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Well, what uh, part of the world are you in? Um, I'm actually in Pennsylvania. Okay. And are you from there? Did you migrate there? Um, yeah. So we migrated, uh, my family and I migrated here about uh, nine years ago. Um, originally we are from, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Cool. Cool. And what's your favorite hobby and do you have any pets or kids? Um, so I am a proud mother of six children. I'm a grandmother of a active six-year-old. Uh, my kids uh, range from uh, 30 years old all the way down to 15. I have four bo- four girls and two boys. Um, we have two dogs. Um, our latest addition is uh, Layla. She's a Rottweiler. Uh, she's about 12 weeks old. And then our dog Zeus um, will be 10 in September. And he is a Eurasia, which uh, many don't, when I say that, they're not really familiar with the breed. And the breed is actually from Germany. It's a mix of a German Spitz, a, a Samoyed, and um, and a Chow Chow. So he kind of looks like a lion. Um, he's a mm-hmm. wonderful dog, uh, just so sweet. Um, yeah, I love big dogs. And we mm-hmm. have a couple of fish that my my husband is obsessed with. He loves um, he loves saltwater tanks. So <laughs> nice. yeah. I actually used to work in the pet department at Walmart, which is a funny side note is I've never had a pet in my life, but anyway, they put me in the pet department at Walmart and, uh, I would sell dog food and all that, but they also had goldfish tanks and betta fish and they were not saltwater tanks, but, um, lots of marine life, uh, in the aisle at Walmart back in my high school days. So that was fun times. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, and I love how you said an active six six year old uh, uh, grand, granddaughter. You said grand, granddaughter, granddaughter, uh, as if there is six year olds out there that are inactive. But you know, <laughs> I, I, I still I still get that that was uh, highlighted. I understand that. Uh, well, I guess because most of my kids are grown. Um, I mean, they're not as active as they used to be. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they're active in different ways. You know, I'm not used to. When my granddaughter's around, it's kind of like um, her nickname for me is Lovey. That's what she calls me. She mm. doesn't call me grandma. Um, my daughter specifically came up with this name. She's like, you're too young to be a grandma. And I don't want her calling you grandma. Um, so she came up with the name Lovey. 
And so um, when she's sweet. around, no, oh, thank you. When she's around, you know, she's just like, lovey, what are we going to do? Like, you know, and, um, you know, when I'm working, she's like, lovey, what are you doing? You have so many monitors and you're clicking away like mommy does. And I'm like, you don't know it, but um, your mother and I secretly run the world. And she <laughs> goes, really? You know, and I'm like, yeah, really? I'm like, we run the world. Just low key, you know. And she just like starts laughing. That's awesome. The keyboard and, and the screens, you know, and us just like moving um, all these documents around because my my daughter, um, she kind of does a similar role. Um, she uh, works for a solar company and she does uh, she's an, a co- an inspection coordinator. Um, mm. So hers is I, I don't envy her role, but, um, you know, very uh, logistically um, consuming. Let's just put it that way. Right. Nice. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, what what got you into the assistant role uh, back in the day? Um, well, I first started as a receptionist at a company called SBLI USA. It was a life insurance company. Um, it was uh, located on 34th Street in Manhattan. And um, I found myself um, just always, you know, being the point person, you know, either kind of sending someone one direction, you know, helping somebody connect with IT or security. Um, And I really liked that, um, just that part of my day where I was able to like kind of connect with people and solve their problems. Um, There was a opening for an executive assistant and I applied for it and I got it. Um, And then that kind of shifted my world because I was no longer the front of the organization. Um, and I was in the back. And so um, I remember there was this woman, her name is Judy D'Amico. I will never forget her name as long as I live. Um, and she was this a slim, adorable, beautiful woman. Um, but she was um, very, uh, how can I call it? Very quick, um, witty. And she didn't take a mess. She was just kind of like, <laughs> she she was very... Um, how can I describe her? The way she looked and the way she acted were kind of like um, in contrast of one another. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of thought she was like a sweet, you know, easygoing, but she was like a drill s- sergeant. But I thank God for her because um, she was the one that kind of gave me my solid grounding as an EA. Um, and because of her, I learned a lot of great skills and, um, and I began my my role as an executive assistant. Um, I then went to other um, companies, uh, media companies, financial companies, uh, then merged into legal companies, um, and then ultimately into IT companies. Hmm. Nice. So what, what's been your favorite industry to work in? Oh, that's a hard one. Hmm. You know, I have to say truly media. Um, At one point, I supported a senior vice president for a media company. It was a subsidiary of Qualcomm. Um, And what I liked about it was that I had my hands in everything. Um, I was an office manager. I I supported her. You know, I I reviewed budgets, Um, you know, I connected with her, you know, her family, I, I kind of had a say in everything. Um, and I liked that every day brought something different to the role. It wasn't like, okay, today I'm going to do Excel sheets and that's it. You know, every day there yeah. was something new. There was a new person to me. There was a new meeting. There was a new business, to you know, new part of the business to learn. Um, there were new skills to learn. And I, I really liked that. Um, and it made me uncomfortable, but uncomfortable in a way where I was excited. I felt almost kind of like being on a roller coaster ride. Um, the days went by quickly. Um, but I, I would say like every day I could go to sleep and say I earned my paycheck today. You know, I, I felt very accomplished. Um, and, you know, every position that I have gone to, I've always tried to um, look at the position and say, I'm coming in with X skills, but I want to walk out with Y, Z skills. I always want to come out better than when I left. Um, 
in out, value being added to me, but also me adding value to others as well. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about the your current role. Uh, it's a very large company. I'm looking here on LinkedIn and uh, Wipro has thousands of employees. Is that right? Uh, to be exact, I believe we have uh, between 250,000 to 290,000. We're a global company. Um, the company originated in India. Um, it's been around for 75 years. Um, they are a technical company. However, it didn't start off as a tech company. It started off um, with kind of um, household items like oil um, and, and items such as that. And then it kind of morphed into this uh, big behemoth that it is today. Um, and we are global. And uh, yeah, it's it's a very exciting role. Um, it's definitely um, stretched me in, in different ways that I wasn't aware that I could be stretched, but in good ways. Um, I work for a leader that um, he doesn't look at me as an EA. You know, when we have conversations, he's like, you're not my EA, you're, you're a leader. You're my business partner. Mm -hmm. It's like, I talk to you the same way I would talk to one of um, my senior managers. You know, your, your um, thoughts and your ideas and suggestions are very much needed for us to grow our business. Um, and having discussions with him along with other members of our team, um, it really inspires me to really do more and be more creative and uh, be present more so than anything. Hmm. That's great. So <laughs> what? Uh, what's maybe throughout your career, what's one of the defining moments or maybe challenging times or maybe even funny, crazy stories uh, throughout your, your career as an assistant that you'd want to share with those listening? Mm, wow. I would say it would be working for the chief legal officer of Morgan Stanley. Um, mm. His name was Mr. Kempf, and that's what we called him. Um, his full name is Don Kempf. Um, and uh, at the time that I supported him, uh, he was already kind of like in his like probably mid 60s, uh, maybe late 60s. Um, but his age didn't slow him down in any in any manner of the word. Um, he was very organized. Um, he told great stories. He was a Marine and he was very proud to let you know that. Um, what I loved about him and what many people didn't like about him was his candor. Uh, Mr. Kempf was kind of straight from the hip. You knew where you stood with him. If he wasn't pleased with you, he would let you know. If he was pleased with you, he would let you know too. Um, but he didn't exhaust it. Meaning mm -hmm. if, if he was upset with you and he, you did something that wasn't pleasing to him, he would just say, you messed up. You messed up big and you need to fix it. And that would be it. If you did something great, he would be like, brilliant. You did a great job and let's move on to the next. It wasn't something where he celebrated forever. And it wasn't something that he harped on forever. If you, if you made a mistake. Hmm. Um, and I liked that from him. Um, it, you know, at that time when I supported him, I was about 25 years old. Um, it was my first time having a really, um, senior role as an executive assistant, um, and he was he showed me through his actions and his daily behavior of how, what it took to run such a large um, entity of, of a business. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really key was that he valued um, writing letters to people he, that he spoke to. So if he had a lunch with you, a breakfast, a meeting, any kind of connection, um, there was a letter that was going to follow that. And it would, you know, have a similar connotation such as, hey, Jeremy, it was really great to see you. You know, I really liked our conversation. Um, you know, the suggestions that you made, uh, you know, let's follow up on that. You know, um, please stay in touch. And, you know, I send my best to your family. Um, and he would give that to you. Right. And there would be, you know, some corrections back and forth. But the rule of thumb was that that letter had to be mailed out no later than 4 p.m. that day. And if it wasn't, oh, you were in trouble. Mm. You were in trouble. Like he was going to hit the roof. And 
I understood why, because for him, that was his way of building relationships. Hmm. Um, this could be somebody that he was going to face in court. This could be somebody that he's known for many years. This could be somebody that he just met. Um, it didn't matter what the relationship was. It was just important to him. Um, and he taught me kind of like, I guess, the beginning uh, steps of networking. And I really appreciated that. Um, and just watching him how he would operate, how he would talk to his directs. Um, another person that was really influential uh, at that time, and, and I still speak to her till this day, um, she was the chief operating officer of his business. Um, and, and I loved her as well. She was the same way, Italian, short, spunky, um, and, you know, very direct. And, and I was okay with that. Um, and I remember I when I got, I graduated and I got my bachelor's and I I was uh, sitting in her kitchen, my husband and I, and I said to her, I said, you know, Lisa, what convinced you to hire me? You know, like I was really junior for the position. You know, what did you see in me? And she said, you really want to know? And I said, yeah. She goes, mm-hmm. well, it was the way you walked. You walked like you had somewhere to go. You walked like you had conviction. She said, you didn't mosey down, you know, as you were coming down the hall when you walked away you walked away like i have somewhere to go i have things to do and she said and that is what i was looking for she was like it was the way you carried yourself and she said i was right about you she said every day you came to work you came to work with a purpose um and i mean look at you now you know you're getting your bachelor's you know and and you're still um i recently got my master's and i had a, a conversation with her and she's like Yolanda, you keep going. She's like, I told you I'm right about you. She said, that's it's the mm-hmm. walk. And, you know, we laugh about it till this day. Um, but just to see that growth, you know, from being 25 years old to now being 47. Right. And just to see that growth and and um, to see those individuals, you know, that have taught me uh, indirectly and directly. Um, it's It's really humbling. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's great. Sounds like uh, uh, some fun uh, fun executives to work for, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's let's talk about the way the world in general sees executive assistants, administrative professionals. And, you know, you mentioned when we connected about being on the show, you mentioned how you're passionate about changing how the world sees assistance and helping executives and other team members and employees understand the significance of what we as assistants bring to an organization. So tell us about your mission or your vision to change how the world sees executive assistance. And maybe maybe even just start with how do you feel that they do the world does generally see assistance and how do you want them to see change their tone? Um, well, first I'll begin with, um, you know, usually when I go somewhere and I tell someone what I, you know, what I do professionally, I get either uh, kind of two reactions. Um, one reaction is, oh, like, OK, you know, surprise. Um, and then the other is like, oh, you know, kind of like, <laughs> oh, well. It's not that big of a deal kind of, you know, response. Um, and either one is it, it doesn't sit well with me. Um, and when I think about organizations and when we focus on what, you know, any great company has been able to establish and, you know, even in reading your book, um, the one thing and the one message that I, I know and I share with anybody that's trying to grow the business or organization or team is that you need an anchor. You need someone that's going to ground you, that's going to help focus you, that's going to take away the things that you don't want to do or focus on so that you can do what you enjoy. Um, And that's an EA, right? That's an assistant. And if you have a good assistant, they are going to be looking at your business in a 360 kind of way, right? Um, I remember supporting uh, my sister at one point. Uh, She's an executive director for Mary Kay. And she's always had personal assistants, always had executive assistants. And at that time, I wasn't working. 
and um, she needed some help uh, just getting her personal and her business um, life together. And I remember working with her and uh, she stopped one moment and she said, you know, I've had many assistants, but I've never quite seen what someone work the way that you do. And I looked at her confused and I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, you are so focused. You know, you're, you know what I need before I need it. And I said, well, I said, I think, I said, I, I think that that's more on picking up on just paying attention to your surroundings, right? Understanding the person's personality, understanding what the business is. And all of those things will give you clues to how an executive assistant can help, right? Um, I think understanding what's important to that person, you know, I could support um, you and then support somebody else. And what's important to you is gonna differ from what's important to that person. And so as an assistant, I think really paying attention to the details and understanding the person's personality and what's important to the business and marrying all those concepts and elements is really what helps an executive system be amazing, right? And then you see results um, because now things are getting done and now things are moving because that executive gets to really focus on their their secret power, right? Their superpower, mm-hmm. you know? And so um, when I think about anybody trying to grow their business, you know, so many people are like, if it weren't for my assistant, I wouldn't be able to do this. Like, they just tell me where I need to be. They tell me what I need to say. They inform me, they update me, you know? And so- the executive assistant position is really seen as as a secretary, right? And no matter what the title is, it's not to demean it. A secretary is still amazing too because they're doing the same things. But it's it's seen in in a way where you're like, oh, you just do like clerical work and you don't do anything that's really important. You're not a real leader. Um, but really, you know, when I think about what I do every day and and you know, when we have these meetings, it's like, well, who do you have to go through? You have to go through the gatekeeper to get time on a big executive's calendar, right? So, you know, when you think about that, am I really not a leader? You know, um, I'm having a conversation and uh, I'm getting the information from you. I'm, 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 I'm letting you know, like, okay, well, what is this meeting about? Can you give me more details? You know, how does this make, how is this efficient for my boss you know, does it make sense for this person to meet with my boss, you know? And I don't always give an answer right away. I let them know, you know, I'll take it into consideration. When I meet with my executive, I'll come back to you and I'll let you know the options. It doesn't mean no, and it doesn't mean yes. It just means, you know, I have to have a conversation first before we we make this this decision, right? Because there are other factors that I have to take into consideration. Um, and I do that because I want people to know that there's a lot of thought and, you know, logistics and maneuvering that go into just making even just one meeting because they're not the only one asking for that meeting. There's so many other things that are going on. That person is traveling. They have to balance their family time, right? What's important to that executive? My executive, he he treasures his time with his family. When I first started with him, um, he was joking one day and he said, my wife is asking me why I don't have meetings in the in the evening anymore. And I said, that's not necessary. The only time that's necessary is when it's really time sensitive. I said, I will make an exception. I said, but I said, you start your day at seven in the morning. I'm sorry. No, we're not right. doing it. Uh-uh. Right. No, you're going to have your time so that you can spend time with your family. Why? Because when they grow up, you can't get that time back. Right. For me, time Time is priceless. And so what I want to do is I want to be able to manage time so that I can give them back the time. So that's why EAs are very important. You know, they're giving the time back. They're managing time. They're making sure that the right people are being um, connected to the right um, other individuals in the right places at the right time. Right. Um, Timing is everything when you, you talk about an organization or leadership for that matter. Right. So we're at the we're the nucleus at the end of the day. We're the foundation. And so I think there should be some respect with that. You know? Yeah. That's great. Well said. 
Um, so, you know, I was looking at your, your bio and, you know, I'll put the, put your full bio in the show notes, leaderassistant.com slash two, three, zero, uh, for those listening, if they want to check that out, but you know, you've got your bachelor's degree in psychology and then your master's degree in organizational leadership. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So, you know, it's a pretty, pretty fun, interesting, um, combination leadership and psychology. So I really want to hear what is your, maybe what's one takeaway from your psychology, the psychology portion of your uh, education that you maybe applied to, or that helped you in your assistant career? Yeah, sure. Um, So when I was originally going to college, I started with computer science, believe it or not. Um, at the time it was the thing to do. Uh, once I got into my programming classes, I was like, yeah, this is not for me. I'm miserable. Um, and I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so I took a break, um, in between that break, had a couple of babies. And, um, after my last baby, I was like, that's it. I got to go back and get my bachelor's. Um, and so, you know, when I was making the decision, I said, I want to do something that's really going to help me in the longevity of my career, but that's also going to be fun. Um, and I thought about psychology and I researched and I saw, I was always interested in um, forensics. Um, but then uh, this new uh, type of psychology was coming out and it was called applied behavioral analysis. Um, forensics was more kind of like medicine, um, you know, kind of almost chemistry, bio and, and all of that I'm allergic to. Um, and so I was just like, this is not for me. Um, and so with the applied behavioral analysis, it was more my lane, um, focusing on one's behavior, their, they, um, their personality. And so, you know, a good portion of being an, an executive assistant is really understanding the personality of your executive. Um, you know, not everyone you're going to agree with, you're going to get along with, you're going to gel with. However, you still have to be professional and and learn how to support them. Um, I've realized throughout my my tenure as a executive assistant that I only have control over what I control. There's certain things that I don't control and I can't beat myself up about that. And so the psychology portion has kind of helped me have a different mindset in number one, dealing with, um, I would say, uh, difficult executives um, and also balancing what I need as an EA so that I don't burn out, so that I can be with my family, so that I can have that work-life balance, so that I can come to work um, ready, willing, and able to support my executive and firing on all cylinders. Um, you know, changing behavior, um, looking at how one may come in one day and, and just noticing just different things. I've I've been able to pick up on things because of that degree with um, my last position. I worked for um, a gentleman who oversaw the infrastructure. Um, he oversaw all of the, um, uh, what is it called? Um, I'm, I'm literally having a blank uh, right now. No worries. Um, for the name, but it it was related to um, data analytics and and infrastructure for um, IT. Mm-hmm. And so we would have these meetings, and so there were certain questions that he would ask. And after the meeting, he would you know meet with me, and he was like, you know, I saw you looking at John. Um, why were you looking at him? And I said, well, he wasn't being honest about. Um, the, the answer he was providing, I said, based on, you know, his facial gesture, based on his body language, he was being dishonest and he was lying to you. He was giving you lip service. I said, you know, I think you need to dig, dig a little deeper in that and really have a one on one, maybe you putting him on the spot or, you know, calling on him in the meeting made him feel uncomfortable. He he felt like he needed to, you know, answer in a certain way that um, didn't either embarrass him or embarrass you. I said, but if you want an, you know, like honest answer, I think you need to ask him on your one-on-one, you know, face-to-face where there's no audience. 
And he would nod and, you know, he'd he'd come back to me and say, you know, how did you know that? And I was like, "Mm." like, you know, you have to pick up on certain people. I said, you know, a lot of people don't realize that I'm an introvert. Um, I like being behind the scenes. I I have learned to be um, more social. Um, However, my social... um, my social interacting thrives more on a one-on-one um, connection. When I'm in a group setting, I can interact. However, I'm not as boisterous or um, connected as I would be in a one-on-one interaction. Um, so noticing that, where is that person um, thriving more? Do they like to be around crowds or do they like to be by themselves so that they can be heads down and not speak to people? Um, I think learning how people operate and how they want to work is really key when you have a team. And I would, I would help my executive do that. You know, he would come to me and he's like, I'm trying to rework some people. Like, what do you think about this person? And, you know, are you, do you talk to this person? And I would say, well, I don't know them, but this is the behavior I've seen. You know, this is what I've picked up on, Hmm. Um, you know, and so you might want to consider maybe asking them this or maybe taking into consideration that. Um, and it's always helped um, move the team forward, move projects forward um, and and make people happier and, and build stronger connections. Um, there was one thing that I created where uh, we would have monthly connections and my executive would sit in a conference room and it would it would be called um, Connect with Chris. And he would just sit there all day and any person that wanted to connect with him or just talk to him, they would just be able to kind of like go in and like talk to him. He wouldn't sit in the office. He would take up like a whole conference room and people just kind of go in and out and, you know, sit down with him, have access to him. And it made people see him in a different light. And it really helped his relationships with his team members. Um, So I think that that degree really helped me pick up on those um, kind of um, behaviors and people and in order to kind of like move forward, move the team forward and kind of help people be situated where they feel most comfortable. Yeah, that's great. So then to kind of, uh, it's been, this has been great conversation, by the way. And oh, thank I you. I really appreciate all your, uh, your insight to kind of wrap, wrap things up on the other side of your, your, you know, your master's in organizational leadership. And then the question that I like to ask many of my guests here on the show, um, what makes an assistant a leader? Mm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think there are many factors and elements that make an assistant a leader, but I think, um, the 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 one thing I would say that makes them a leader is listening and learning. Um, you know, I know some executive assistants that are in really senior roles that I've worked with in the past. Um, and I think the fatal mistake that they've made is that their title has defined them as a leader. And I, I truly don't ag- agree with that. Meanwhile, I have seen other assistants who were junior to the role step in, ask questions, want to get to know you, build build relationships, want to learn from you, and then come 360 around, then teach you and bring you into the fold. Um, those are individuals who I think are leaders. And so... Um, I really just think that it's it's a character. It's not necessarily anything that an EA specifically has. I think it's something that any person has. And and I really just think it's, you know, L and L, you know, listen and learn. Listen and learn. That's great. Nice <laughs> succinct way to answer the question. Nice job. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Awesome, Yolanda. Well, is there anywhere that people can reach out and connect and say hi to you? Oh, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, You know, please feel free to just uh, connect with me. Um, If you, uh, I know that I think I have something on my connect where um, I think you have to put an email in, Um, you know, I would just suggest people just write a little um, note 
like maybe on one of my posts or anything and let me know that you want to connect and you know i'll uh, look for you and then we could connect that way okay it's a little shortcut <laughs> yeah yeah perfect well thanks again Yolanda, and uh you know best of luck to you and your career and with your family and your your dogs and fish and all that fun <laughs> stuff and yeah it's been a pleasure speaking with you and hope to talk again soon well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. Um, and I hope you feel better um, mm-hmm. and you get over your um, your colds. <laughs> oh, thank you. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullos.com